Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Anime Expo Light special and exclusive discussion about hate towards Asian Americans. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is David Ono. I'm a journalist and also the evening anchor for KBC TV here in Los Angeles. So if you're watching this panel through the Anime Expo, you are likely a fan of Japanese animation. So we hope that you have an understanding and an appreciation for how this art form enhances all of our lives and can stand as a perfect example of how diversity and multicultural influence makes us better and richer as a society. And for that reason, we think it's important to have a conversation about an alarming trend taking place in American society. This forum tackles the collision between two of the greatest problems today, and that would be racist hate and COVID-19. The topic of hate towards Asians has been closely covered by news outlets across the country, including in my own outlet. And I commend this Anime Expo for using its platform and power to help us have an open discussion about it and what we can do to make our world safer, more respectful, and more fair. So let's dive right into the problem. Tragically, ever since the virus broke out, innocent and unsuspecting Asian Americans have found themselves the target of unprovoked attacks. I did my first panel on Asian hate more than a year ago, and we are still talking about it. In fact, it could be argued that the problem has only gotten worse. We've seen the video on the news, on social media, from the streets of Los Angeles, to Oakland, to New York City, to Texas, and in between, assaults. Blatant, violent, sometimes deadly physical attacks. On top of that, tens of thousands of verbal assaults and other forms of offense, like spitting, most of which aren't even reported. So we have a dynamic panel of speakers with us today. We're gonna to talk all about this topic, get some insight on the history of it, and also find out what we can do about it. So first of all, Connie Chung Jo is the Chief Executive Officer of Asian Americans Advancing Justice Los Angeles, the nation's largest legal and civil rights organization for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Through this crisis, Connie has worked tirelessly spreading the word about this rise in Asian hate, and most importantly, providing guidance on what to do if you find yourself a witness or victim of hate. So Connie, it's great to see you. We've done a number of these panels. Thank you so much for being here. Dr. Lily Ann Welty Tamai with UCLA. She is a historian of US, Japan, Asian American studies, and mixed race studies. She is a highly acclaimed professor and researcher and has a broad and deep understanding of Asians and the complexities of living in American society. So there is a rich and tragic history regarding Asians pursuing the American dream, and she could help us understand that. So Lily, thank you so much for being here today. And Dr. Mitch Maki, the president and CEO of Go For Broke National Education Center, a nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving the legacy and lessons of the Nisei World War II veterans. Dr. Maki is a highly sought after international speaker on the Japanese American redress movement and its relevance to our modern world. He is one of the leading scholars on this topic. And Mitch and I, I will reveal that we do a lot of projects together. So Mitch, uh, great to see you two here. So uh, wonderful panel we have with us. I'm familiar with everybody. Thank you for joining us. And why don't we kick things off with Connie? I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to ask you, what are the latest numbers that you have received when it comes to hate directed at Asians and describe how bad the problem is in your opinion? So thank you, David, so much um, for, for the question and also for having me today. So we know that according to Stop AAPI Hate, which has been collecting and publishing the most reports of anti-Asian hate since this pandemic began, they say that since the pandemic began through May, the latest reports they have is at least 6,600 reported incidents of hate. But we know that that is really just the tip of the iceberg. Pew Research Center issued a report recently where they had surveyed Asian Americans and 45% of the Asian Americans they had surveyed said they had experienced some kind of incident related to their race or ethnicity since the pandemic began. That means nearly half. And you think in this country there are more than 20 million Asian Americans. So we're talking about largely millions of people as opposed to just thousands who've experienced this kind of hate. We know it is bad enough that when I speak to people, what I'm hearing is um, universities are saying Asian American students are taking leaves 
from school at unprecedented numbers. I speak to uh, employers who are saying their Asian employees are taking leaves or requesting accommodations so they don't have to return to the workplace as it's physically open because they're too scared to go on a bus or take the metro or leave their houses. In fact, I've spoken to many Asian Americans, especially this year, who say, I'm scared to leave the house. My parents no longer take their daily walks. And folks are saying, I am more scared of being attacked in public than I am about contracting COVID-19. And I think that's a very sobering thought that for Asian Americans, we are more scared of fellow Americans that we interact with on the street than we are with a virus that has taken the lives of more than 600,000 Americans. So this is a very large problem. The violence is pervasive and it is leaving many Asian Americans feeling scared, angry, and quite traumatized. Carney, I, I, just to follow up on that, and I mentioned in my opening remarks that, that I first did a panel on this more than a year ago. And I have to say, personally, I thought that this was going to calm down eventually. And what we've seen, remember when Chinese New Year rolled around, it seemed to only get worse. In fact, it seemed to be peaking at that time. When it comes to trends, have you seen a change at all in the last year, year and a half? Is it getting better or is it still as bad as we've seen it? Yeah, I, I think you're right, David. What, what we saw is at the very beginning of the pandemic, there was a large number of um, incidents of hate against our community. Unfortunately, it was not really getting uh, noticed as much as it, as it is today, um, but we did see a lot of violence. We saw people, uh, we saw a man getting stabbed at a Sam's Club in Texas. We saw a woman who had acid thrown on her face in New York City, um, but it didn't really reach most Americans. Right? They weren't talking about it in the same way. We then saw it start to die down where we didn't see quite as much violence. And then certainly around Chinese New Year, as you mentioned, it started picking up again. And I think that is actually a regular cycle that around Lunar New Year with the added attention to the Asian community, there is uh, added um, sometimes violence or hate towards our community. But this year was much worse because on top of that was the pandemic and already the scapegoating of our Asian American community. And then we saw really the spate of uh, attacks, especially against our elderly. And I think what we've seen is both higher rates of, of violence and then we're also seeing higher attention from from really regular people. And I really attribute a lot of that to the Black Lives Matter movement, which really told America, it was a wake up call that we need to think about systemic racism in this country. And it's not just a black problem when we talk about anti-blackness. And so people are now seeing the rise in anti-Asian hate as not just an Asian problem that needs to be deferred or delegated to our community. It's something that America needs to talk about. But you're right, I think there has been, unfortunately, increased violence. We've started to see deaths, which we had not seen last year. And so I think it's both a combination of more violence and then more sensitivity and recognition in mainstream America of what that looks like. Right. Um, eventually, I would love for this conversation to kind of steer towards silver linings, and that is at least people are starting to become more aware. Awareness is super important in getting beyond this problem. Lily, I wanted to bring you in. You have so much to add when it comes to the history of this, uh, of, of Asian hate in America. And people largely, uh, we, since we don't teach that, people are largely ignorant to that history. But first and foremost, you being an Asian, in fact, this whole panelist, we're all Asian, so we all have our own personal feelings. How do you feel personally when, when you see and hear about these assaults picking up on our streets? I think for I think one thing to that folks have to also recognize too is that Asian America is not a monolith, right? And I think that there's a particular you know um, targeting of people who are physically e East Asian representing, right? I know that we have AAPI is such a large term, right? Asian American Pacific Islander that includes folks who are South Asian, who are Southeast Asian, Pacific Islander. And I know I have seen in, in online and social media, a lot of Pacific Islanders are saying, you know, this is, 
not necessarily an AAPI issue. We're not getting targeted in the same kinds of ways that East Asians are, right? And folks who are um, from many, right? Much more, if we say more phenotypically Asian. I myself am, am mixed race. And I know that within the Asian American community, we have a really large number and growing number of mixed race people. And so for me, I recognize that my physical kind of, you know, my features don't necessarily, right? Like I know that I I know that if I am walking, I'm likely not going to get targeted the way that somebody is much more visibly Asian looking than I am. And I and I want to make sure that that's clear because we do have folks who are in a sense, right, that there's a certain kind of, if we want to call it right, privilege or whatever, however we want to describe that. I think that this is just recognizing how diverse Asian America is and that you know, after 9-11, we saw a lot of South Asians really getting targeted, right, for and, and being the scapegoats of that, you know, 9-11 um, um, issue in the, that we had in, in, um, in, in 2001. And I think in this moment, we are really seeing East Asians really being the tar East Asian looking at individuals being the target. <laughs> I'm <so> <laughs> Sorry, we're all working from home. So oh, I have, I have my dogs with me. <laughs> <laughs> all, all of us, all of us have our, have our dogs. No problem. <laughs> One second. <laughs> so Here. sorry, you guys. Here. No, that's great. That's great. Okay. So this is just a reality, right? But, but hold on. We're dog sitting, so... There's one, we got the loud one over here. So sorry about that. So kind of back to what I was saying, but I think that what we're, what, what I've sort of noticed as someone who studies Asian America, who looks at mixed race communities, as well as, right, you know, Asian American history, I think one of the things to remember too, is that Asian America is not a monolith and some, and in this moment, we are witnessing one, you know, certain groups really getting, having to, to, to navigate the brunt of a lot of these um, physical attacks, as Connie had just mentioned, but also to that, these these physical attacks, at least I think, are are micro were, were microaggressions that have been building for a lot of years, and I think COVID nineteen has really pulled back a lot of the that re racism that had been festering for a very long time. And and for me, as someone who is very connected to the Asian American community and the Japanese American community in particular, it, watching this is just really heartbreaking because I know that there's you know, those of us who have the privilege to maybe not be attacked, right, as a result of the way that we are perceived by others, I also really feel very strongly for doing whatever I can to kind of, to, to participate, organize, to be an activist, if I can't be an activist, to donate, right, and I think for me, that's, that's the connection that I, that I have here, so. Yeah, well stated. And uh, the complexity is very important to get into, which we will soon. Mitch, you're also an expert when it comes to the history of a lot of these chapters in America, but you're also an Asian man and an Asian father who has children out there in this world. Personally, what are your feelings when you see uh, the talk of all these assaults happening across America? Thank you, David. And, and before I respond to that question, I want to Thank the Anime Expo for holding this panel. It's uh, an important panel and, and I appreciate deeply the ability for us to gather and have this conversation. You know, in, in answer to your question of how I feel, I think I feel like most of us do and people across the nation, a, a tremendous amount of sadness, a tremendous amount of anger that this is happening and, and fear, you know, fear for uh, my children, my family, my wife, uh, you know, uh, and certainly for people who I don't even know uh, that we're all facing this. Um, I think the, the other thought that comes through my mind though is that this is not an entirely new phenomenon that racism against Asian Americans, discrimination against Asian Americans and now violence at, at this level against Asian Americans is something that we have been aware of. Now, what is new I think is the amount of coverage and maybe even the, the frequency and, and the uh, the violence that we're hearing about. But one of the feelings that I'm experiencing is that I'm very proud to be an American. I'm very proud of the values of our nation and what we aspire to become as, as a country. And when I hear these stories beyond seeing violence against Asians, what I'm seeing is Americans attacking Americans. And I think we, we touched on that uh, previously that this is an internal problem to our nation that we as Americans of all backgrounds need to begin to address 
because it is a, um, a phenomenon where an American is turning on a fellow American. But also the context is that um, I'm encouraged, and you've touched on this, and Connie would touch on this, that the outpouring of support that we are also seeing across the nation, the people of all ethnic backgrounds, religious backgrounds, uh, uh, social economic backgrounds are coming forward and saying, this is wrong, and we can't continue to allow this to happen in our nation. It started, as Connie mentioned, last summer with Black Lives Matter, and we saw people of all backgrounds hitting the streets, saying this is something we need to be cognizant of and change in our nation. And I think we're starting to see some of that with anti-Asian I don't want to be Pollyannish about it. I mean, it's still a terrible phenomenon, it's something we need to address. But I'm encouraged by the fact that people of all backgrounds are coming and paying attention to this. And I would still much rather be Japanese American in 2021 than in 1941 when no one came to our defense. Yeah, that's a great point, which we're going to get into in just a second. In fact, we should delve a little bit into the history, but Connie, I want to bring you in back into the conversation because your organization has done wonderful things through the years. You've been in existence literally for decades. So it's not just recently that it's been necessary to have your organization's assistance. So what did bring about your organization and, and why? What was your purpose to begin with? So Asian Americans Advancing Justice LA um, was founded in 1983 by Stuart Quo in the wake of the murder of Vincent Chin. Vincent Chin was a Chinese American man in, uh, in Detroit, Michigan, who in 1982 was beaten to death by two white auto workers who blamed the Japanese automobile industry for the economic demise that was happening in that city. And so, uh, what happened after Vincent Chin's murder was there was a wave of Asian American activists who came out and started to say, we need to talk about the needs and the rights of Asian Americans. Because Vincent Chin, going back to Lily's comment about this, this monolith treatment of Asian Americans, he was Chinese American, yet he was blamed for what was happening it, with the automobile industry in Japan. It didn't matter that he was not Japanese. Um, what we also saw was that this repeated pattern of scapegoating of Asian Americans when this country feels threatened. In that case, they felt threatened economically by Japan, but we saw it in 9-11 with the treatment of South Asians and Muslims. We saw it in World War II with the treatment of Japanese Americans. In fact, this country just has this tendency when America feels threatened by disease or foreign um, powers or anything else that often our community is getting scapegoated. So we were founded in order to, which was really a wake up call that America needs to deal with the, the, the treatment and the racism towards Asian Americans. And that's how we formed as a civil rights organization. But we've also become the largest legal service provider for the API community in the country, because we know that our country being as diverse as it is, speaking as many languages as it, as it does, our community members needed a culturally specific organization to meet their needs, both linguistically as well as culturally, because we know that it can be a barrier for many of our community members to go to mainstream organizations or to the government directly. And so now we serve over 15,000 clients a year, and particularly during this time with anti-Asian hate, have developed a very robust program to support victims in our community. Right. And then that Vincent Chin case that you bring up, I'm glad you, you, you talk about that because that was a monumental moment when it comes to fighting and deciding to fight back. And, you know, the, the whole egregious fact that the two assailants, the two murderers who killed Vincent Chin didn't do a day in jail. And the judge even said in the trial, after the trial, that these weren't the type of people that you send to jail. It was egregious in so many ways, and it was maddening if you were an Asian American at that time, and it still is today, so I'm glad you pointed that out. Lily, let's get deeper into the history because you know so much about just the whole anti-Asian sentiment in this country, uh, something in my opinion we don't teach enough of. Give us a taste of that history, that ever-present notion how Asian Americans are always dealing with this issue of being seen as forever foreign. 
So that's a, it's a really great question because I think more so than European immigrants who've come to the United States, Asian immigrants have always had this position that they're not going, they're unassimilatable aliens, like that they, that they cannot become American. No matter how long you stay, um, ask any Asian American if they or their family members have ever been asked, where are you from? And that where are you from question is oftentimes rooted in curiosity, but it sometimes stings a little bit for folks who have been here for generations, right? The Chinese American community is like in its sixth, I think even seventh generation, the Japanese American community is well into its fifth generation. And that's over a century of being in the US and, and to have this idea that you're not quite American. And even if it's just a question like, you know, where are you from? Where are you really from? That gives, um, that makes Asian Americans sort of feel like they are not necessarily connected to America, even though they are culturally, linguistically in so many ways. And I think part of this is it's it's not only just the kind of popular, cult, the, the sentiment within popular culture, but I also recognize that it's the US Congress passed laws that really made a, Asians foreign, right? There's this idea called the yellow peril that um, assumed that Asians were encroaching on the West and that they were, you know, it's this very xenophobic theory about nationalism in America and Asian Americans were thought of as this yellow peril and in order to protect America, they had to create legislation to prevent them from entering. And that is really the beginnings of where we start to see all kinds of, it's, it's, it's ordinances to legislation to right, national immigration policy that prevented Asians from coming from 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act, one of the only pieces of legislation that marks an ethnic group um, to immigration acts where Asian, you know, quote unquote aliens who were Asians, um, they, they couldn't own land, they could only lease it. And that prevents folks from really being able to build, build a family, build a business in the US. Um, and really from 1882 all the way to 1942 with the executive order 9066 that pushed the West Coast Japanese American community, um, 112,000 people at the time into incarceration camps during the war for nothing but being Asian, right? They, they didn't, two thirds of them were US citizens and they were pushed into these assembly centers and which were racetracks where we house animals and livestock and then onto these camps where they didn't know how long they were going to be there. They didn't know when they were going to get to go back and could they even go home? And I think all of these, you know, just immigration act after, you know, legislation, executive order, these things all really showcase this sort of sentiment that Asians and Asian immigrants and even their American born citizen children are not welcome, are, are foreign. And this is, again, I think something that Asian Asians and Asian immigrant, Asian Americans are even dealing with today that they're, that nobody says things like yellow peril, um, you know, as, as what they're doing instead is like a physical attack. But I think that what we're seeing is the manifestation of this long history, decades long history of this yellow peril sentiment and that Asians are forever foreigners. Absolutely. That that question, where are you from? I mean, it's it says a lot because it, some people who may be asking that question may think that they're being open minded, that they're being friendly. But what it, you're really saying is, I don't believe you're an American. And the person they're talking to could be third, fourth, fifth generation American, even, you know, uh, more steeped in, in being American than, than the person asking the question. Yet the assumption, because there's an Asian face in front of them, he's going to ask, you must not be American. Therefore, where are you from? Um, very important comment. Uh, David, Mitch, oh, go ahead. Yes, go uh, ahead. Connie. Sorry, David, could I just jump in here? Because I just wanted to add, you know, this this forever foreigner feeling or this perpetual outsider, it's so pervasive. I just want to share a personal story. My father-in-law is a U.S. foreign American citizen who has been war decorated by this country for his service in the Vietnam War. Yet early on in this pandemic, when he walked down the street, he was told to go back go back to China and call the racial slur because he is of Chinese descent. Um, you know, um, Asian Americans can never be American enough because of the way we look. And so that kind of treatment is, is, is so pervasive. And so when we talk about, instead of asking, where are you from? People, 
even if you're talking to somebody who you think is an immigrant, what I would suggest is just ask them what you really mean, which is, you know, what's your ethnicity? Or if you're uncomfortable asking that, you could even say, you know, what kind of what kind of last name is that? But when you ask, where are you from? Like you said, what it's what the underlying message is, well, you're not from here. And so um, uh, if you really want to even know where somebody's from geographically, when you ask that to an Asian American, uh, the way I always ask it is I would say, David, where are you from? Are you from LA? I would ask that follow up question to re enforce that I'm not trying to ask you if you're from another country, because that's why you perpetuate the forever foreigner myth. Absolutely. Those are great points. Yeah, Mitch, you know, uh, David, I know you're going to ask a question, but I just, I just got to validate what yeah. Carl is saying, too. And I'm sure every one of us has been told uh, how well we speak English. You know, and, uh, you know, I can imagine for Lily having someone say how well you speak English and you can say I probably speak English better than you and I can write it better than you because I have a PhD, you know, and, and uh, the truth is that what Connie and Lily are saying is that, yeah, we are forever seen as the other and, and well, there's work to be done. And I think one of the things we're going to get into also is talking about that's why it's so important for us to tell our stories. That's why it's so important for the stories of all of our communities to be shared and shared broadly with people across our nation so that we're not continued to be seen as the other. Great points. And, and we'll get to sharing our story in just a second. But And, and what you said, Mitch uh, and Connie, it does remind me, even me and, and Lily, I know you, you've studied mixed race and I'm a mixed race person, of course. So I'm less under scrutiny than other Asians. But even in college, I went to a mixer. Uh, my dorm in college had... Uh, international students on the first floor. And one day we decided to all have a mixer and a, and a counselor came up to me and asked me if I wanted to meet some Americans. And I was like, <laughs> wow, okay, that's kind of cool. I mean, I, I'm a, I learned a little bit right there on, you know, just the assumptions made by the way we, we look. And while I laughed about it back then, today it has huge re relevance. Do you want to meet some Americans? Because there's those assumptions because, you know, you are Asian. But Mitch, I want to get into a little bit of go for broke because um, I know it's, 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 it's important to both of us. I, I'm, I'm on the board. You're the president and CEO. Why is it, what, what is go for broke and why is it important to preserve these great Americans' history? Well, you know, as Lily was sharing the history of the Japanese American community, but also the Asian American community, we've all heard the saying that those who don't remember history are doomed to repeat it. And while that sounds rather trite, it's very true, you know, that history repeats itself. And unless we're very much aware of those dynamics and those processes, we're doomed to repeat the tragedies that have been uh, perpetrated upon people in the past. So in answer to your question, David, Go for Broke National Education Center tells the story of the Japanese American soldiers who fought for the United States during World War II. And just in case anyone in the audience doesn't know this story, very briefly, 1941, the US is attacked by the Imperial Nation of Japan and it thrusts us into the Pacific theater of World War II. And Japanese Americans began to wonder immediately, what would happen to us? Would we be treated like the American citizens we were, as Lily pointed out, two thirds of whom had been born here in America the other third having lived here 30, 40, 50 years. And the reason why they weren't American citizens is because they were legally prohibited from naturalizing. Or would we be treated like the enemy because we shared a common heritage? Well, we got our answer two months later, February 19th, 1942, President Roosevelt signs executive order 9066 and it creates the underpinnings by which nearly 120,000 individuals of Japanese ancestry are forcibly sent into concentration camps across the United States. And we lost our homes, we lost our jobs, we lost our businesses, but most of all, what we lost was our sense of place at the American table of citizenship. About a year into being into the camps, the army realizes that it needs more men, literally men to go and fight in the war. And they come up with the idea of creating this segregated unit of Japanese American soldiers. And I'd like our audience to imagine what that would be like if your family had been taken away, ripped from its home, 
all your possessions lost, put in the middle of a camp in the middle of a desert, not knowing when and if you'll ever return. And then your son or your brother is asked to possibly die fighting for this country halfway across the world. And yet Japanese American young men said, send me, send me, I am an American. And this is the way that we can prove that we are loyal Americans. And they would go on to become the most highly decorated unit of their size in American military history. And David, you do a wonderful job telling that story and documenting these stories. These young men, boys really, 18, 19, 20 years of age, would go on to be the most highly decorated unit of their size in American military history. And to me, what this story demonstrates is the wisdom of America's promise. The promise that in our nation, we're not to be judged by the color of our skin, the nation of our origin, or the God whom we choose to believe in. And we tell this story, and we tell other stories, and, and those on this panel tell stories, because it's important that all Americans hear these stories and know what it really means to be an American. And I would like to expand this beyond just the Asian American community, because we know we have brothers and sisters in the the Black American community, the Latino American community, Native American community, Hawaiian community that tell their stories because we're all a part of the American tapestry. And, and that's why it's important to tell these stories. Absolutely, beautiful, beautifully said, Mitch. And it does bring to light a couple of things in that conversation. I do personally believe that the story of the, the Nisei soldier is one of the greatest stories in American history. And that's why I'm always trying to tell these stories because these were great heroes that fought heroically, but they did it under such incredible prejudice and duress. People need to know their story, which you don't teach enough about. But you also mentioned 9066, which is a, a great example of how a president's executive order has so much power. One man signing a piece of paper can uproot and change the course and the lives of 120,000 people and likely forever. And that's a great example of the power of an executive order. We always have to keep that in mind as we elect a new president. We hear about executive orders being signed. That's a great example of how uh, an executive order can change the direction of people's entire lives. Mm -hmm. But Connie, I wanna get back to what's happening today. And this is, in my opinion, one of the toughest questions of this whole panel. And that is, what do you do? If you find yourself in the middle of being offended, being assaulted, or if you witness somebody else being offended or assaulted simply for being Asian or anything else for that matter, what's the advice from you on, on the, the plan of action for us? Sure, and so uh, we can divide into two categories, David. If you are a victim of anti-Asian hate, what we encourage you to do is report it. Whether you report it to the police or through 211 or through Stop AAPI Hate or uh, by calling Asian Americans Advancing Justice's multilingual helpline because we have people who will answer your calls in six Asian languages as well as English. You need to tell your story and you need to share it because we need, uh, we need those numbers to show how large of a problem this is. And we need people to, in America, to have the reality check of what is happening to fellow Americans and their neighbors and community members. Uh, there are a lot of barriers that prevent Asian Americans from reporting, whether it's language or whether it is culture. Some people uh, grew up in Eastern cultures where you're told, you know, you don't you don't air your dirty laundry. You keep unpleasant things silent. And we know for women who have been victimized two to three times more than Asian men during this pandemic, they have additional barriers. I've spoken to Asian women who said they were um, concerned about reporting because they were afraid they wouldn't be believed. They were told um, that or they felt that they were embarrassed and ashamed by their victimization. And I mentioned that because for women, that is a common problem, whether you're talking about race-based uh, discrimination or in the gender-based violence sphere as well. But we need to hear those stories. So report it um, to those places that I mentioned and, sh and share what's happening. 
For folks who want to be allies and support Asian victims, there are a few things you can do. One is generally learn your history, learn what's happened, push for things like Asian American studies and curriculum in our K through 12 education. Um, go on and, and find out for yourself. And I will mention that LA versus hate in Los Angeles has put out a 64 foot panel. And this poster is at the Rosemead Park in the outside of the building. And it was done by a Japanese American artist who did it in a comic strip style. And it shares who are some of the leaders in Asian American history and some of the ways you can help and get involved. So for you, those of you who are anime fans, I recommend you go check that out if you have a chance. Um, but the other big thing that we are really pushing is for folks to take bystander intervention training. We offer that at Asian Americans Advancing Justice LA. Over 75,000 people in this country has, have received that training. You can go online to advancingjustice-la.org to sign up. They're free one hour virtual trainings and you learn what's called the five D's which was developed by another nonprofit called Hollaback. But what you learn is um, distract, which means how do you indirectly interrupt a situation to uh, de-escalate the situation. So if I'm walking down the sidewalk and I hear somebody yelling at an Asian American, I could drop my cup of coffee or the change from my purse right as I'm passing them. What that will do is it'll just make everyone for a second stop in their tracks, see what the commotion was about. Sometimes that's enough to diffuse the situation or provide the victim with the way to kind of exit. Or I teach delegate, that's the second D, which is find a person of authority. If I'm on the bus and I hear something happening to another passenger, I could go up to the bus driver and say, hey, you need to pull over this bus. There's something happening back here that you need to deal with right now. Um, uh, the, the other one is document. I could pull out my phone and videotape the incident and then ask the victim if it's okay to publicly post this or to share it with that person. Um, I could talk to, I could directly intervene, which means uh, go up and directly say to the person, hey, you need to stop. This is not okay. Um, and the last one is delay, is go up to the victim after the fact. We, I was speaking to one victim who said after she had been uh, verbally harassed for two minutes, what scared her the most was walking to her car because she was afraid the perpetrator would be waiting for her in the parking lot. So their delayed strategy would be to escort that person to their car so they feel safe. So these are very straightforward, common sense uh, strategies you learn in our training. Once you have that training, you have the arsenal to know what to do in that split second moment when you're witnessing it. But we want everyone to think about what is my ownership to create a safe community, a safe neighborhood for those around me. And this is what we are really encouraging folks to do. Man, those are really great points. I, I think though, I do have to follow up on that. And that is what if you're so incensed, you want to go to war against that guy, you want to, you want to, you want to fight that guy, what's your advice? What do we do there? Right, so what we really encourage is what's most important, um, the, the priority is that you as a bystander keep yourself safe first. So we don't want you to jump in there and start trying to get into a fight with the other person. You need to assess which of the five Ds will help um, intervene in a way that keeps you safe, right? So it's, it's we, we deal with two problems. One is the folks who want to just get in there and get involved and might put themselves in harm's way. And then the op opposite problem where bystanders say, I saw something happening, but I was scared to get involved because I didn't want to get hurt. So these strategies, you pick and choose the ones that will help um, the victim, but also keep you safe. And so it's never about going up there and fighting a person. Um, you can use the direct strategy of facing the person if you assess it's safe to do so. But if it's not, think about using one of the other four Ds, like finding uh, a security guard or a manager and asking them to intervene instead. Absolutely. David, David if I could so, jump yeah. in, because ahead, I, I loved what mentioned. Connie said, and, and I love the word that Connie used in terms of allies, you know, that uh, we do have a number of allies out there. So many people care about this issue. But one of the things that I'm seeing is that people don't know how to be an ally. And I'm not talking about the actual event, because I think Connie uh, 
covered that very nicely. If you see something happening, but I'll give you an example. I, one of my dearest friends that I've known forever is a white American uh, male, and he has not raised this issue with me over the past year until finally over lunch, I asked him, hey, what are you thinking about this? And he started to tear up and he said, yeah, I've been wanting to talk to you about this, but I didn't know how. Yeah, I didn't know how to raise this issue. And he talked about how he worried about me, he worried about my family, blah, blah, blah. We had a great discussion. It's, uh, if I can add another D, Connie, it would be dialogue, which is for, for allies to reach out to people that you know are Asian American and, and have that dialogue. We welcome that conversation, you know, to, to know that our, our friends and our, our um, colleagues who may not be of Asian descent, that this is as much a concern to them. And it, it provided me in that moment with a tremendous amount of support. So again, to all of the folks in the audience who may not be Asian American, but know a lot of Asian Americans, reach out, have that discussion and, and let us know that it's on your mind too. That's a great point. And it brings us all closer together. We know that there are people that have our backs and, and we have their backs, which is great. Lily, I have a really tough question for you too. And I think this is one of those questions that I really struggle trying to explain to people, but it's very much part of the problem. And that is this whole model minority myth. What is that? And, and, and why is it detrimental to Asian Americans? Yeah, so the, the model minority myth, it's that it, for folks who may not have heard this, or you might think, oh, well, look at all these Asian kids are really good at math and calculus and physics. And oh, so they must, it must be fundamentally because they're Asian that they're good at those things. And the reality is, if we kind of look back at our, it always comes back to our history and our immigration policies. Um, this is kind of something that it was really interesting the way in which it came up and in terms of timing. So as Mitch had mentioned, and we've all kind of talked about after uh, the signing of executive order 9066, Japanese Americans were really seen as like this, the face of this enemy of the United States and put into these camps. And it's just a couple of decades later, I mean, we're on the heels of, you know, kind of recovering at the end of the war that all of a sudden Asian Americans get coined as this term, the model minority. And this was written in a 1966 article and I, I can cite it, I've got receipts um, by William Peterson. If you ever take any of my Asian American studies classes, I'd, I'd make you read it. Um, but it, it is this really interesting article that coins this term that Asians are to be revered, right? That they're really a hardworking, really good example of, Ameri of, of a, an American immigrant group. And yet it's just so odd that it the timing of when it comes out is, I mean, we just incarcerated an entire population of people. How is it that America just flips the switch so quickly? And it's this model minority myth that that assumes that Asians are hardworking, really good bootstrap up, pulling up from the bootstraps Americans. And what, what actually was happening in terms of timing, like I mentioned a second ago, was that in 1965, our immigration policy changes with the 1965 Hart Seller Immigration Act. And what that does is we, we take away our race-based quota system that had been put in place and it's much more equitable. We allow 20,000 people per country per year to come to the US. And there are several things that we do in addition to changing who gets to come, but the kind of person who gets to come. So, so we have folks who are reunified by, you know, the, via family reunification or, um, via a skill set. And so Americans, Asian Americans who were already in the US could sponsor their families. And so we, we, we have those folks coming and joining um, us in the US, but we also have this particular clause that, that selected for highly skilled immigrants. And so many of those immigrants who came, particularly from Asia, filled in our, the, the labor vacuum that existed in the US, which was really in a lot of STEM fields and science and medicine and engineering. And so we have a lot of folks who had come from places like China, Taiwan, um, India, and they filled in these, the, this, this employment gap that we had. And it so happens now that those folks, if you know, they're, you're coming to work as a rocket scientist, you're probably gonna be pretty good at physics. Your kids are probably gonna be good at physics too. That there's this association that, oh, Asian Americans, because of, for whatever reason, based on race, 
they just must be inherently good at these, you know, at, at school. And what that does is it, it completely ignores a lot of the structural racism that we have in the United States. It really glosses over difficulties of other ethnic groups, right? Particularly even within Asian America, a lot of Southeast Asians came after the Vietnam War who were refugees and didn't have that highly skilled sought after, um, you know, set of, of, of desirable Im immigrant skills that we wanted as a country. And so the model minority myth is, it sounds really good because it sounds like, oh, America likes us because they're calling us model minorities. We're not the yellow peril. We're not the enemy any longer. But what it does is it's really harmful because it, again, it, it sort of homogenizes the entire Asian American community as this one thing. And to me, and I always tell this to, to my students as well too, whether positive or negative, right? It's still racialization. It's on, it's the same coin of racialization. You're being racialized because of, you know, you're thought of as the enemy, but now you're getting racialized because it's positive. It's still racialization. You're still not actually being, you're not being looked at as a human, right? You're not, the essence of, of who you are is, is absent in that whole racialization. So I don't know if that, I, and I, I, I yeah, I, I hope that kind of gets at that tough question. And yes, it was a tough question. So it, yeah, it always is. It's a tough one to, to handle, but, but it's also, we have to understand that, that the outcome of that is negative for, for Asians and it's, it's stereotyping. And then stereotyping is the root of all of our, our racial evils, uh, uh, truly. Mitch, you, you talk about uh, Asian Americans telling their story. So let's talk about that. What do you mean by Asian Americans need to tell their story? Well, first of all, before I answer that, David, because there's so much going on in this conversation, I just want to applaud what Lily said. I mean, that was a very nice uh, description of model minority and the problem that it has. And in your point that it, whether it's positive or negative, it still racializes our community. It racializes humans. And the, the other word that I've always associated with the model minority is that it dehumanizes us. You know, that any myth about a people dehumanizes them, whether that myth is that they're stupid, lazy, and uh, can't amount to much, that's, that dehumanizes them. But whether they make us into superhuman calculators, you know, that dehumanizes us and doesn't allow people to see us as human beings that have the same needs, same challenges, and, and the same uh, need for opportunities as any other group. So again, thank you, Lily. I, I, I thought that was a great uh, description of why, it, why the myth is harmful. And David, in terms of uh, telling our stories, you know, I, I applaud what Connie does and, and what Asians for Advancing Justice does because they are addressing the immediate crisis. And, and certainly I'm not an expert in how do you deescalate the immediate crisis, but I think a, a part of the long-term solution for all of us in this nation is for all of us to tell our stories because we are a nation of immigrants, uh, whether we came here uh, willingly or whether we came here forcibly, or we are a nation of overthrown people. And that, with that, I refer to Native Americans or Native Hawaiians, you know, who had their kingdoms or their, their uh, nations overthrown. We all have a story and, and it is the diversity in our nation that gives us strength. It is the diversity in our nation that gives us a foundation. And yet the truth is that many of our children today don't know these stories. Many of our children today go through the school system and don't hear it. And I know, and I'm a little bit older than the kids today, just a little bit, but uh, when I was coming up, you know, hearing about our history, it was primarily white heroes, white stories, and white accomplishments. And yet the truth is that people of all colors and all backgrounds have contributed to the greatness of this nation. And to this day, when I talk to young college students and I tell them about the camps during World War II or about the 442nd and the MIS during World War II, they look at me with blank stares on their faces like, I didn't know this. I, I, no one ever told me this. And that's just our story. That's just the Japanese American story. You know, what about uh, the stories of all of our communities that have come and created this nation that we live in? And so I think one of the long-term solutions, and that's what I think, you know, uh, professors like uh, Lily do is 
educate our next generation about the diversity and the contributions of all groups. And, and in, for this panel, that group is the Asian American community and what all of our Asian American communities, you know, Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, on down the list have contributed to our nation. Great point. And you know, that kind of leads me into something here, but, but first of all, to, to tail your, your point off, this is an anime expo, which I know there are attempts to create animation and comics about the 442, uh, the Nisei soldier. And this would be a great place to, to help teach those stories, the rich stories of our Asian history. And I know a very popular series uh, is about uh, an African-American samurai uh, or a black samurai. So in that light, we could do the same thing with some of these Asian stories to kind of help them, uh, help people understand, you know, these, these great moments in our history. Uh, but that also brings me to a, a very difficult part of the conversation as well. And I'm going to lean on Lily a little bit for this one. And that is, I want to handle this conversation responsibly because um, this being anime, um, we should talk about characterizations and how things and people are portrayed. There's such a thing as hypersexualization of Asian women, uh, de emasculation of Asian men. And I just want to plant some seeds into our viewers who are out there loving anime. And there's so many wonderful things about it. But we also have to think about how we characterize people and we have to do so responsibly. So Lily, if I could bring you into this conversation about some of the, the downfalls of characterizations and what we should think about. Yeah, I think one to build on like what Connie was saying earlier too, just about the ways in which racism and sexism can't be separated. I think that that's what we're, we're navigating here as well too, that there's just been, it's just been very normalized to, um, to hypersexualize um, foreign women, um, particularly when we look at Asian women um, and the ways in which it is very, as, as Mitch had mentioned too, right? This, it's dehumanizing and stereotyping, but I think it's that this is something that we don't even question that is, it's just, again, it's such a normalized part of how we approach um, some of these caricatures. And, and the same for Asian American men, we have often emasculated Asian American men. And a lot of that is rooted in the work that Chinese laborers did as um, in the gold rush era and in the transcontinental railroad era, they were they were doing cooking and cleaning as side hustles because you got miners doing mining and then these Chinese men figured, well, somebody has to do, right, cooking and cleaning. And those jobs had been typically done by women. And so at, at that point, we really begin to, to emasculate um, Asian American men. And by by doing so, what we, we, we end up seeing is something very normalized that that's just, oh, that's just how we, you know, see them. and we continue kind of that dehumanization process. But I think furthermore, particularly for Asian American women, they're not desexualized. They're in fact, hypersexualized. Um, Asian American women are, are hypersexualized as objects. A lot of this was normalized through our intervention during World War II in, in wars in Asia. We've kind of continued that through the media, but also the idea of massage parlors and spas as kind of these right um, areas where everybody's a sex worker, right? And I think that that's also something we have to, to remember too, that it's the it's making everybody homogenous and monolithic is super problematic because you've got a huge diversity of, of all of these, right? Asian American men and women and children. And, and but I think the, the larger takeaway point here too is that we have to separate, right? Racism and sexism. And um, it's this oriental conflation is really the problem that we end up seeing. And so challenging those images, right? Not, you know, not accepting them. And I think it's really all of us as, as the audience, the, the recipients of, of this media to, to, to say like, no, I'm just, I, I don't wanna watch it. I don't wanna see it. I don't wanna continue that. And I think that those are the kinds of things that help us make that change um, just overall as, as a larger community, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, this issue did come up uh, in a big way when it comes to that, the terrible shootings going on in, in Atlanta with, with women in massage parlors being shot. And the, the assumption was made throughout the media that they were sex workers, which was completely inaccurate and really tragic if you think about it. These people lost their lives and especially tragic for the families that were left behind. 
Um, Connie, as I, I want to start getting our conversation into more of the uh, optimistic, positive future that we are heading into. And this is a this is a, a very broad question. You could take take with it what you want, but um, how do you see our society? What do you what do we need to be doing in our everyday lives to make us a better place? To make us understand each other better, to bring us closer together, even though we may look different, but we still are largely the same. So I think, as you mentioned earlier, David, this is there is a silver lining in what has happened here, and that it's really been a wake up call for Americans to, to prioritize talking about racism, talking about what's happening to the Asian American community, and dispelling things like the model minority myth and the forever foreigner myth. So we, but what we need to do is we need to make sure that we take this from being a moment to really a movement. How do we really make it stick? How do we really continue the education awareness? And I think right now we have such an incredible opportunity to, be to develop and strengthen multicultural coalitions. Right now we need a stronger infrastructure of Asian Americans working with Latinx, Black, Indigenous, and other communities to talk about how do we collectively address what is a systemic racist uh, culture that puts whites on top and everyone else on the bottom. And so we have this opportunity to do this now. Um, you know, I was at a rally after the Atlanta shootings and there were folks out there who were chanting, um, you know, stop Asian hate, stop Asian hate, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. And it would go in back and forth. And I was looking at the hundreds of people here and they were Asian and black and Latinx and kids and, you know, hearing, you know, Chinese grannies yelling, you know, black lives matter followed, you know, in the next second by a young black man saying stop Asian hate. That was a beautiful, really galvanizing moment for me. And I really look to the millennials and the, and the Zoomers, the young people who seem to have a much better understanding of race and authenticity in that area to really be the next generation to do this. And if I can just finish with something personal, um, you know, I started this job as a CEO of Asian Americans Advancing Justice last August, and it was not an easy decision for me to go back into the legal career and to change from the other job that I'd been at for 11 years to take on a role, a new role in a pandemic. But when I did so, it was because of the rise in anti-Asian hate and then the murder of George uh, Floyd that, that spawned a public reckoning through Black Lives Matter around systemic racism in our country. And I said to myself, this moment of time is going to be in my kids' and my grandkids' history books. And when they asked me what it was like to live through this moment, I wanted to be able to say I was doing something as part of the solution. And I think for all of us in our audience, we need to recognize we are living in a moment that will be in American history books. And you need to ask yourself, what am I doing to be part of the solution? That's a great point. This will all be analyzed and will be in books someday. Thank you so much, Connie. Mitch, uh, how about you? Let's, let's get some final words from you. Well, you know, I think Connie did a, a beautiful job of capturing the, the power of this moment. And uh, inherent in that really is the opportunity for us to build alliances across all community lines, ethnic lines, religious lines, and so forth. So uh, I, I just want to echo that and, and thank Connie for the work that she does at a, a, uh, Asians Advancing Justice, and also to thank Lily for the type of work that she does as a professor educating the minds of you know, new folks. Um, part of me, when I think of what we're going through, I, I feel very frustrated because I was one of those young activists that got motivated by the Vincent Chin uh, story back in the 80s. And when I see what's going on today, part of me realizes that in some ways things haven't gotten better, but in some ways they have. And I was sharing this with a, a group of students and one of them, and I said to them, you know, fighting racism is not a sprint. And he goes, yes, it's a marathon. I said, it's, it's not even a marathon. It's a never ending journey on which we must always remain vigilant. And so I think that's the lesson that I would want people taking away is that yes, this is a moment in time and it's a very important moment in time, but we've always got to remain vigilant as we go forward. And the last thing I'd like to say to the, those in the audience is 
you know, you, you've heard from Connie and from Lily and from David today, all of whom are very articulate, all of them who have dedicated their lives to addressing this. And that's what we need. We need that leadership. But really, all of us, all of us on this call are a part of the solution. And so for our audience out there, you don't need to be the head of Asian Americans Advancing Justice. You don't need to be a professor you know, in, in the UC system. You have friends, you have family, you have children. Tell your stories to them, share your stories. Tell your friends who are not Asian American about our experience. Help others to understand because it's, it's all of our struggle together and we're all gonna be a part of that solution. Fantastic. And Lily, finally to you, final words. Thank you so much. I feel like I, I can't do, I have to follow such wonderful acts, um, but I know Connie and Mitch have said so much already to take the bystander training, to be an ally, to pay attention, to educate yourselves. But I also think that um, to, to piggyback on what Mitch said, um, that there's lots of ways that we can do these things kind of kind of in a multi-pronged approach, right? As an individual, it always feels like you just can't do enough. Um, but I think we can, I think you don't, you can join an organization, you can donate to all of the existing organizations that are already doing this work, right? We've had scholars and activists and people who've already, who've been doing this for, for years, donate to, to their, to the work that they're already doing. Um, I tell folks, Folks, you know, you can always start a book club. If you feel like you didn't get an education um, because the way the K through 12 system was set up and maybe you didn't get a chance to take an ethnic studies class to learn some of these histories, start a book club. Like there's lots of amazing books and sometimes the authors will join you, right? In some of these book clubs. Um, you guys all have access, folks who are super into the, right? Anime, the, there's so many graphic novels. I'm certain one of those authors are gonna come to your book club if you start something, right? I mean, there's just lots of ways to do that kind of as an individual, but also too, I think, learning that history is also we're, we we got to play the long game, right? We, we got to reclaim that history because you don't know what you don't know, but you know that you don't know it. So you got to go find it. And so I think, right. I think one of the things I always tell folks is that you, it doesn't, you don't need to take a class when you're on vacation, go to these sites across Asian America. I, I cannot wait to go to put flowers on Vincent Chin's grave. And I mean that I haven't, I just haven't had a chance to get to Detroit, but I hope, right. There's, there's places all over Angel Island, Promontory Summit. There's all these amazing spots across America that have these ethnic histories in these physical spaces. Go on a camp pilgrimage, one of the Japanese incarceration camp pilgrimages. Um, and you know, you're gonna see a lot of new things. And I think that's what's powerful is that you, now it's your turn, right? Your turn to go and educate yourself and do these things. So, so thank you, yeah. Great, great comments. Those are great suggestions. And yeah, and, and that, that point about ignorance, you know, like you, you don't know what you don't know. It, don't be ashamed of being ignorant. It's not your fault you're ignorant, you know, but you have opportunities now to kind of get out of the haze and educate yourself and look into these, these issues. But great point. Uh, Lily, thank you so much. You're on the front lines of molding those young minds. And, and, and uh, Connie, uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, you know, Lily said support organizations. Everybody out there support what Connie's doing. Everybody out there support goforbroke.org. Uh, Mitch and I work so hard trying to get these stories out there. And uh, all of you panelists have been just fantastic. We really appreciate you uh, joining forces tonight, uh, today and, and, and making this happen. And, and this has been a, a really enlightening conversation, everybody. A huge thank you to, to you guys, to everybody out there viewing. I hope you're having a wonderful time at your Anime Expo. And then fingers crossed, we're gonna see you all in real life next year, uh, July 1st through July 4th, 2022. Um, yeah, be there and we can continue this conversation. Thank you all for joining us today. Have a great day. Thanks, David. <laughs>